Hi, my name is Raquel Baldelamar. I'm a Forbes columnist, and today we are at the Aspen Ideas Festival speaking with Mr. Stuart Weitzman, founder and chairman emeritus of the Stuart Weitzman Shoe Company. He started designing footwear while in college while working at his father's shoe factory in Massachusetts. In 1986, he launched his company under the Stuart Weitzman brand, which sold in more than 75 countries. In 2015, Stuart Weitzman organized the sale of his company to Coach, and as part of the deal, stayed on as creative director. Today, Coach and Stuart Weitzman are part of Tapestry, and Stuart Weitzman has over 700 employees across 80 global stores and over 375 million in annual revenue. Today, we're gonna to be talking about entrepreneurship, brand identity. I love to talk about that. And the creative <laughs> process. Welcome, Stuart. Okay. You started designing shoes in your 20s while working for your father's shoe company. Can you talk about your creative process of how you actually design shoes? It's, um, it's an idea process. We, we, meaning me and my design team, we pick topics and themes that we think will be both fashion right and in demand by our customers. And around those themes, we then begin to design, well, the shapes, the leathers, the heels, the toes, all the elements of what make a shoe, uh, including, of course, that it has to fit as well as possible for the type of product it will be. That means a high heel has to fit well, but it's not going to fit like a sneaker. Yet in the high heel world, it should be one of the best fitting. And that's an element that we never, never leave out of our, our decision-making process. And once those designs are, uh, are laid out, and they're continually coming, by the way, so there's a start process, and we begin to make prototypes of them. And from some prototypes, well, others are born. You see a great idea, you want to expand on it, um, and we often make our best shoes at the end, when we've had the experience of looking at several hundred that have been done before the final shoe is made. And that takes about four months, I guess, um, from thinking to creating. So the creative process, the brainstorming process of actually designing shoes can take about four months. It takes about that, from the initial thoughts that are not quite focused mm -hmm. to the end result when we're presenting the samples, that would include the finished samples at the market weeks that we attend. And have there been particular things that you look for to get inspiration to help you come up with ideas of what would be a really great shoe design? Always. Or is it just different? No, always. Uh, you know, everything around us, someone has designed. Think about that. I mean, even the simplest uh, fountain pen or this, uh, this boom that we're speaking into. Everything, everyone designed it with a function and an attitude and a look. And I am always looking at what the world creates to get inspiration. Uh, obviously, architecture is a, a field that generally gets into our thought process because of the structures that can be translated into heels, for example, mm -hmm. or wedges. And, uh, and then there's the related industries like clothing and the trends in, in movies that can often start fashion rolling. Um, you can't, I don't believe any designer can do his best job in his own studio from beginning to end without being well versed on what the world is doing. Thank I you. certainly don't. I, I look at the world, I even talk to women. My goal is to create what you want. Now I know you're not going to be able to tell me what I should design, but I have to know what you want in order to interpret what I believe would be right up your alley. What I love about the Stuart Weitzman brand is that it really combines form and function. It's beautiful, sexy shoes, but you can actually wear it and, and, and walk around in it and feel comfortable in it. You know, that's, um, it seems so logical to me. I often wonder why there are so many ill-fitting shoes because that's, you know, like economics 101. I mean, we, to get you into my store the first time to buy a pair of shoes would cost me $8,000 on average. We spend a lot of money to publicize what we're showing and to put them in, on the web and in magazines, social media, um, and that's 8,000 bucks for every new customer we get. What do you think it cost me to get you the second time? 
Very little. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. Uh, you're satisfied with what you bought, you'll be back looking. Uh, if I have what you've got, well, you've given me maybe the first shot at it. So there's an economic reason I want the shoes to have function and comfort as well as design. No one knows when a shoe is on a shelf how it's going to feel. So it has to look good to get you to pull it off that shelf. Right. But once you put it on your foot, we want you to say, wow, I didn't realize this would feel so good. And uh, hopefully that's how you would, felt. Would you say that's a brand principle? It's oh, our DNA. It is? Oh yeah. The comfort? No shoe is put in the line unless we believe we've executed it in a really comfortable manner. We don't want to chase customers away. And not only will we lose you, but your friend. You might make a comment, I can't wear his shoes anymore. You know, all those kind of things are said all the time. So um, it became my first and foremost goal. And I would say today, when you asked about the design process, I skipped over what is 50% of that whole process. And that's the time spent in engineering the shoe. So half of it's design and half of it is engineering for our brand. What would you say are some of the other brand principles of Stuart Weitzman? Oh, well, I have learned um, over all the years without being able to formulate them on day one, you kind of learn as you go along, at least I did, there are some pretty elementary principles that have become part of our company. Our brand is based on values, not on rules. I always feel like rules are very restrictive, you know, oh, it's outside of the rule, you, or it's like a horse wearing blinkers. But if you have values, you can adapt to all the changing markets. Uh, like in this digital age, you, values are always there and you can apply them to any situation and any changing market. And we avoid rules and we, we really love values. Um, we have to learn to say no. That's another important element in our company when I ran it. There is such an easy tendency to um, give in to the market and take a big order or promote your product to get more sales. But in the end, it has a consequence. And I like to say no. I'm always contrary to an idea until it really is explained well when someone else is presenting it to me because there might, it might be someone who is responsible for generating sales and maybe they want to do more online sales, uh, off-price selling. Uh, and that's part of their goal and they get a bigger bonus. The, so I have to, we have to judge that. And we say no a lot. We turn down customers who would give us big orders because they don't, they don't fit our brand. I don't, if I don't feel the customer we're catering to is walking in that store, I don't want them to use me as, you know, as a calling card or a lost leader. So we say no, mm -hmm. we do that a lot. I'll tell you something else that's, that's important. It happens to a lot of entrepreneurial businesses. We all want to grow. We want to scale our businesses so we can grow. And so many entrepreneurial businesses don't think about that. And they grow without uh, forethought uh, and without putting in place the tools that it will help ensure success. And that's the scaling of your business. You have to be able to scale it well. And, uh, and that's been a part of everything we do in our company as well. Well, you scaled it pretty well to building it to 75 stores. Uh, that's just in the USA. We, uh, we have a lot of licensees who've opened stores and uh, probably 200 points of sale under the headline Stuart Weitzman around the world, as well as customers who run their own boutiques and buy them. When you talk about scaling, how do you ensure that the culture of Stuart Weitzman actually remains consistent across all of those stores worldwide? You have to have a pretty good team to uh, take the message around. We often would train the manager in other stores first, like go to Stuart Weitzman University, let's say, mm -hmm. and learn our way and learn how to treat the customer and how, learn how to, this is so important uh, and you don't think of it as a consumer, uh, that, this value in a retail store, learn how to give back to me who's creating the product, the feedback I need to make what women want. 
um, and we train them to do that. And the, it's, it's almost all stores would, would want to, would recognize you have to be courteous and you have to compete with the, the return policies of other companies. That's almost like ABCs today. Um, but the, the other aspects of making sure that you pick up the best elements of your best store and transfer it to your new one and, to, and bring back ideas to the company, now that, I don't know that it's unique to us, but it's certainly very important to us. And is that feedback put in some sort of repository? How does that feedback from a store, but like an individual customer uh, or 10 customers? Well, the, the manager passes it to our general merchandise manager um, and our marketing team, and we all talk about it. There are, an, in the company I ran, maybe there were five people who made these major decisions. We didn't need board of directors. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we made decisions like that. My, I always said my board of directors was the president of our marketing, the president of our merchandising, our CEO, uh, me as the creative director and founder, the head of our retail. They were my board of directors. I have always felt that they know so much about our company, they can give me better advice than outsiders uh, in a business the size of mine. And how has online sales and more online shopping changed the dynamic of the business model? Or do you, are you still investing in retail stores or are you putting more efforts now into... Oh, you know, online has changed uh, all retail. And um, surprisingly, it had a huge impact on selling shoes. If you asked me 15 years ago, well, forget it. Women have to try them on. They have to feel the leather. They want to have, fall in love with the shoe. Um, they're not going to buy it off a picture. Um, Zappos proves us all wrong. Yeah. It's a company that started, I don't know, 10 years ago. It built a billion dollar business selling shoes online and figured out ways to accommodate the problems. Like you can return it, you can try another size. You know, They made it easy and it grew and then all, everyone else noticed. So. Uh, Neiman's and Sachs, Bloomingdale's, Nordstrom's, uh, Stuart Weitzman stores, we all opened our websites to do the same kind of thing. I wouldn't be surprised, I never really added it up, but if in the USA, maybe half the shoes we sell are sold online between all of our customers and ourselves. Wow. And that affects retail in this sense. It's not so important to have stores in cities that are not that big to generate the volume. Um, it is important to be present on the best streets of the world, to where tourists travel also. Those are two elements that still outweigh whether or not you're gonna do as much business as you might have done a few years ago, because there's prestige and image, there's association that comes with being on a street of the highest brands, or on a street where, let's say, every Chinese tourist is gonna. So um, those two, elements still play a role in where we open stores. You're really good at getting very low cost publicity. Oh yeah. <laughs> You're a great <laughs> I marketer. Have, I don't have a lot of money to spend on it. So. <laughs> uh, if you could give advice for people who want to get low cost publicity, what would that be? I tell you, if, uh, do things in a unique way because it will magnify its value. Uh, when you do something that's expected, I bet you it's overlooked by the public. I don't even think you get your money out of it. But if you do something that's surprising, even shocking, um, you'll get extra publicity from the magazines and the newspapers and the websites that write about fashion because it's unique and they, they need stories to fill their minutes of the day as well. So they, they look for that. And you will get the impact of being not associated with everybody else doing the same thing. And every decision we have made that was of any significance, we always were driven to let's not go down that same straight road. We know we want to get there, but we can get there going this way or that way or that way. Uh, think it out. And you know something? It seems like, well, that's not easy. It is easy. Once you do it a few times, that's how you begin to think naturally. Yeah. You don't have to you know, rack your brains about it. It just comes out uh, as it would if you were trying to do it the simplest way. That's what they teach at the Stuart Weitzman University. <laughs> I hope they've learned it. <laughs> and I hope our new owners continue to learn it. <laughs> Talk about your process for hiring a shoe designer. What do you look for when you're hiring um, another person to design this, the, 
the shoes. Well, I never hired another person to design the collection. I did hire other designers to contribute ideas to the collection. And I really uh, balanced, I've only had two at a time in my career other than myself. Um, and one was pretty classic in a sense that most of the shoes that she did, we would be able to sell well to lawyers and doctors and housewives, professors. And the, the other guy is uh, incredibly imaginative in an impractically commercial way, which became my job to make it more commercial, but he was incredibly imaginative and would give me ideas and shapes that uh, you wouldn't ordinarily get from most shoe designers. And uh, they were, they could be new and revolutionary and therefore an important part of the collection. And I would have to uh, make sure they work. I mean, if he wanted a seven inch heel, I wasn't gonna make it, right. but it might work at a, at a four inch heel or even a flat. You know, the concepts can be translated. So how would you determine whether somebody was, you know, had that right creative mix of being able to create comfortable shoes and stylish shoes to work for your brand? Well, the comfort thing is is not so much their role. The engineers okay. take care of that. Okay. Um, but in the interview process, you see what they've done in their career. Mm -hmm. um, I did have a couple of uh, people right out of school and to show some of their creativity, as much to help them along as not. Um, but I, I've always hired experienced designers, and they've been with me many, many years. The last uh, team I had before uh, I uh, gave up my, my role in the company, uh, one was with me 18 years, the other 15 years. So I, uh, I haven't been burdened with the, uh, the interview process mm -hmm. lately. And I, after a year, you get to know them and they get to know the brand and they know how to design into it. Um, you do have to be careful. We always need to be fresh. Now, I kind of like to say maybe 70% of what I have always done is evolutionary. You can, you know where it's going from where it was. It evolves. And what does fresh mean in today's Well, world? that's the revolutionary. 30% has to be revolutionary, 20%, whoever you are. For us, it was 20 to 30%. And those are the ideas that might bomb or might be the next great shoe. But if you're never trying, you're never going to win, right? You don't buy a lottery ticket, you'll right. never win the lottery. So we try that and we test it out. And once something hits, it becomes a, a collection in itself. And that's how you kind of do it. When I, you ask, you know, what makes something fresh? It's your decision. Right. You're the final vote. And I will tell you, I, I almost never can pick my best shoe each season. So you never. have picked shoes that, you've designed shoes that you thought this would be great, but yeah. it, it, the market mm -hmm. didn't like it. Mm -hmm. but, but I have your thigh-high shoes. I knew that was great. And that, I knew it knew the that. day I made it on my assistant. <laughs> I knew it, I knew it. Yeah. And then uh, Giselle, God bless her, asked for a pair at a, at a uh, I don't remember for what occasion. It was May before anyone had seen it in the marketplace. No ads had even come out. And she said, I said, why do you want it? She said, I, I love it. She said, and I'll, not only that, I'll wear it to, next week. I know what I'm gonna wear it to. Have a That's good time. Great. And she actually wore it on Boston Common with her rock star husband and her two kids. Uh, and of course the paparazzi were all over the park, you know. And there she was in 80 degree weather in shorts and thigh high boots. <laughs> I love Boy, that. Boy, that started a trend. <laughs> I want the Gigi boot. Ah, that's actually the one that I made for Giselle originally. Really, that's the Gigi that. boot is my favorite. <laughs> that I'm, uh, that that's my next uh, shoe that I'm. Is going that you mean the ankle boot? No, no, no. I want the yeah, the ankle boot. Oh, I want oh, the Gigi that was ankle last boot. Year. That, that was, was a great boot. That, I love lace, that. Oh lace. yeah, it's super sexy. Uh -huh. I love that. Mm -hmm. You talk about how your dad gave you great advice when you were starting. Well, one thing he said to me out of the frustration for me was one of my shoes was being knocked off by a company whose product sold at less than half of mine. And I was, I was like, what can we do, Dad? This is terrible. He said, let me tell you something. When they don't copy you, that's when you're in trouble. If you think about that, I don't think you could say it any more accurately, right? 
you want to have a product that people copy. At the same time, you want to protect your customers, meaning the stores you sell it to, and the women who buy it who don't want to be at lunch with someone who's wearing the same thing they bought for half price. So um, it's all in the branding. You have to convince them you want the original and be proud to own the original. And that's all part of the branding it's and the marketing of the company. Branding. Yeah. What, if you were a young man today and you were wanting to start Stuart Weitzman today as a young man, the market has changed. Online is just much bigger. Would your process be the same for starting the company or would you do something different? What would, if, you, a, a young, if a young person wanted to come to you and say, I want to start a shoe company, a shoe business, what advice would you give them in today's world? Be the same thing. I tell them, do yourself a favor and work for a few years at the kind of company you'd like to be. Mm -hmm. Learn as much from them as you can. Let them make the mistakes, not you. Um, and when you're ready, go for it. That's what I did. That's what you, you worked at yeah. your father's and, shoe company yeah, in Massachusetts. And then with my brother, and then, uh, but that was just for a couple of years. I went to a, um, it, at the time existed the New York, the American Stock Exchange. I, I joined in a company, which is, I think became NASDAQ, uh, a company that was on it, and they found for me the factory to create the collection I had in my mind. Mm -hmm. And I worked with them for seven years. And I was the creator and the salesperson. I really run, ran the show as a startup, from true startup. After it started, I didn't. I said, I, I, I'm going to do this. I don't. I don't need to be here anymore. I can do it without your help. Uh, and uh, and I did. And I don't believe I would have had start off success without those years of experience. I know I wouldn't. I met people who then I could have ended up hiring later on. Mm -hmm. uh, I got to know them well enough to know how competent they were. I met factories that these people had engaged to make what I was designing. I ended up using them. I met retail customers who were buying the product under this other company who now became customers of mine. I learned a lot at no cost to me, sometimes cost to them. That's what I would suggest. And the rest of the process is the same. We make a product by hand. At the moment, you can't make it any other way. Someone today at this festival said, by, 19, by 2030, shoes will be made digitally with 3D printing. I said, well, I'm not going to worry about that. <laughs> but if, if that's the way it's going, then that will be a different model, obviously. But currently, you still have to make them one at a time by hand, and it's a process. And you said how you chose to forego China as your manufacturing place. Yeah, I didn't want any part of that. Instead it was, a, what, what did I, first of all, it was, a, there were a lot of reasons. I don't know, one is first or one is second, but it was the, they were just substituting American sweatshops that we got rid of. And they were, you know, they were making product over there with people who weren't earning you know, anything that we believed was a decent living under working conditions. American companies over time have really helped change that. As I give credit to the leadership of China, they saw it as a necessity also, not taking it away from them. But when we had to follow the American work rules in other countries, that began to change. When I started, that didn't exist. So I, didn't, I couldn't even consider them. And the only two countries other than China that were making lots of shoes were Spain and Italy. And Spain became my first and only stop. That's great. What challenges mm -hmm. have you had in your career that <laughs> you've learned from? Can you talk about it? I guess the them? biggest challenge was balancing my family, who is so important to me, with my, I call it hobby, because that's what my, I ended up working at my hobby with my career uh, was. That was the biggest challenge. And I guess I had great kids and a real understanding wife who took on all, probably a lot of my role for a, you know, a long time. Um, and we overcame that well. Today, my two daughters are my best friends. Um, as far as everything else, I never encountered something that, we did, that I thought we needed to do that we couldn't do. We figured out a way to do it, you know? It's like, it's like the grass growing up through the cracks of the sidewalk. How the heck does it get through that? Mm -hmm. You can get through it if you really believe that's the way to go, and you have to keep that persistence in, in, in everything you do towards that goal. And, and I and the people who worked for me always did. 
So I can't tell you about any real challenging disaster that we had to face. You, there's just a lot of optimism that I see. You we had... loved it. We lo Do you know, um, 25 years was nothing for my employees to be with me by the time the business was sold to Tapestry. It was nothing. They, they loved it. We loved it. A big family event was every day in the factories or in the offices. When you were working, you know, a lot, when it, your hobby, pursuing your hobby, mm -hmm. how did you take time to pause and recalibrate yourself? Did you do anything, like, did you meditate? Did I you... never stopped playing tennis, ping pong, and skiing. <laughs> I loved sports as a kid, and I always felt if you can keep doing that, maybe your birthdays don't count. I also spent, even though my time was limited, lots of time with my kids. I remember, I maybe was in Spain a month, and home a month, and Spain a month, and home a month, and that's alternated for the year. And we did, uh, we did cool things. Take trips on the spur of the moment, and just, um, I don't know, we became friends. Uh, that, that, was, that was cool. But I don't think shoes were ever out of my mind. Couldn't help that. I guess, I don't know, if you're writing music, do you ever stop thinking about writing music? Or if you're making that painting, and I'm not putting, trying to put us on a scale, we're making uh, wearable, what I've been telling people around here at this arts festival, it's wearable art, really. Everything we do is artistic. But uh, uh, you just, when you like it as much as I did, and it's natural to you, and it gives you pleasure, it's hard not to wake up at three in the morning with an idea and note it down, even though I'd woken up my wife, and unfortunately. <laughs> how did you do all of that between managing a family and running a business and also managing your health, maintaining your health? I think the sports helped. My wife, had, she, she made sure the family was running properly. And, um, and she also worked in the business, which helped a little bit uh, in important ways at the beginning of, of, of our cycle. And I played ball, I work out, I, uh, I've been lucky. Is that, can you? Maybe good genes, I don't that know. That helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about your morning routines? Is when it, I'm in Spain or when I was in America? Let's do, let's start or with America. now that I'm retired. <laughs> let's start when you were in America first. Talk about your morning routine. I would, uh, well, I'd have to be up early because Spain is six hours ahead of us. So, and they close for a two, their siesta. You've uh -huh, heard that from right, the siesta. Right. And I didn't want to miss them till after the siesta, like the day is three quarters over. So I would communicate it. Our time would be six. Their time would be 12. And it, there were a pile of... Uh, mostly at that time before email, faxes on my machine to answer. Um, that, that took up a while before breakfast. Then I would uh, maybe play ball somewhere during the day and then back answering all their questions at night because they would be asleep and I'm ready to roll. That's great. And what <laughs> is next for Stuart Weitzman? Now well, next is, or, is there, next is here. It's not like I have to think about next. I already planned. I'm doing next. Um, a lot of things. Uh, we're, we're lucky as a family to have, uh, we're not going to spend the money we made on things that we don't need. We're just not like that. But we are going to spend it and are spending it uh, on activities that give great pleasure. When, when you can help someone else or some other organization and do it directly, mm -hmm. not like just writing a check to the United Fund where you don't know where it goes. You, you, I don't know that there's a better pleasure than that. I mean, it was exciting to get the first Neiman Marcus order, but it was pretty exciting to see what something we did at Boston Children's Hospital, for example, how it benefited young kids. So we're doing a lot of that. My wife has always been involved in charity. She has, I always said, I don't have to even think about it. You've got a heart for both of us. Um, so now that I'm freer and I'm kind of involving myself as well, and another big aspect of my uh, new time, newfound time, is education. I'm teaching classes on entrepreneurship and brand building at, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. I had gone there and they asked me back. Um, in September and October, next semester, I'll be continuing with them and adding Princeton to my agenda. Uh, this semester, I gave pretty exciting lectures to uh, students at Yale and at Harvard, and I ha I'm telling you, everyone I had as much fun as them. 
and everyone. They, they're used to professors with their textbook mm -hmm. routine, and it's what they do every day. And here's this a whole different kind of approach. This is really how it works, yeah. kids. It's a business, how you did it, how I built a brand, the unique things, how I, treat, how I decided who to hire and, and train them as leaders. All that stuff is, when it's real, I think they absorb it very well. Yeah. Not well, that they don't need their traditional textbook education, but this is a plus for them. So I've been doing that. That's fun. Well, you're teaching a lot of people. You've taught a lot of us at Aspen Ideas Festival. Mm -hmm. Mr. Weitzman, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you for watching.